watch a wholesome video on TikTok or Instagram and it makes you feel good? I mean, so much of the internet can be this toxic, argumentative wasteland, but for once you're sitting there smiling at your phone? Imagine that! Imagine a piece of content that actually makes your day better. And then you open up the comment section and it's a fucking war zone. Going into 2023 with the same person since 2010. Oh, that's nice. They've been together for a very long time. Clearly they've worked hard and been able to make a life for themselves centered around their shared interest. And I mean, really that's the dream for anybody, no matter what that shared interest may be. And who cares about this? Grinch. Video gaming is the worst hobby one could have. What a waste of time. Not like what I do, which is spend all day on my phone telling other people that they're wasting their time. I'm Yes. Living behind a screen. Aren't you doing the same thing? No. <laughs> you have gamer in your bio. Are gamers extremely lazy? Do they ever get up? I like to think that this person isn't making fun of them. They're just genuinely concerned for their well-being. Like, wait, have they really been sitting there for 13 years? I hope they're okay. What if they got stuck? Like, I know that you're opening yourself up to criticism whenever you post anything online. That's just the nature of the internet. But it's crazy that even the most uncriticizable posts where someone is just happily doing something and isn't hurting anyone else in the process still gets criticized. All right, here's another TikTok about dishes. In our house, I cook, he does the dishes. And when he cooks, he does the dishes. Harmless joke, right? They're just subverting expectations of what you might have expected her to say. So really there's no reason for someone to get like super pissed about this or anything. Oh, so he's twice as useful as you are. L girlfriend. So much entitlement. The women that posted this and the women that are commenting on this, just because you don't like doing it doesn't mean he does so about helping and being a good person. He rather does the dishes because he knows you'll never do it without moaning about it or showing the initiative to just do it. You just let him do it because you're lazy and entitled, feeling offended when called out. But ask yourself, if you're feeling called out, doesn't that prove my point? This video is eight seconds long. Slavery. That's right. Someone watched this video and thought, oh my god, that's exactly what being a slave is like. And five people agreed? Slavery is when I have to do the dishes, even though I was the one who cooked that night. Simps love to defend this irrational thinking. Imagine if the genders were reversed. I know, right? Then the comments might be insane. Normalize men men doing chores, normalize women changing oil and fixing the toilet and paying the bill. Ah yes, changing oil and fixing toilets. Two things that notoriously need to be done as often as the dishes. Shit, I change my oil every time I drive. Only the best for my car. How often do you even have to fix a toilet? Every couple of years at the most? What are you doing in there? Are you shitting grenades? Look, I don't know who this couple is, but I'm positive that this eight second video does not sum up their entire relationship. Like in my house, I'm Amanda does the dishes like 90% of the time, but I cook 90% of the time. She cleans more often than I do, but I do all the grocery shopping. I don't know, one single chore doesn't tell the whole story. But even still, being in a relationship isn't supposed to be this one-to-one -one transactional exchange where every chore must be split down the middle and every good deed must be reciprocated immediately. Hey, I just did something nice for you. Do it back or I'm gonna post about this on TikTok. We talking about it's my birthday oh i'm supposed to give you a present too you would if you loved me like no you just figure out what works best for you guys and if something's not working then you talk about it clearly these people are traumatized from a past relationship where they had to do a chore and they haven't been able to stop thinking about it since it's time to move on all right you gotta let that shit go there's another common type of tiktok i've seen multiple renditions of see you later Bye. You've been a great out today. That's all right, thank you, bye. And honestly, I like TikToks like this because I think this is really healthy and a good thing to point out. Like having the desire to be by yourself for a little bit doesn't mean your marriage is bad all of a sudden or you've lost your spark. Most couples go through this, most couples do this. You are still your own person with your own hobbies and interests. It's not the end of the world. Like sometimes Amanda comes home from work and wants to tell me everything that happened that day and that's great. And other times she just wants to come home and listen to a podcast and play Stardew Valley for three hours. And both of those are fine. That's not good or healthy for couples. Well, this is crazy unhealthy in a relationship. That is terrible relationship advice. When kids are down, it's time to be together. Each of you should have some 
some time to do what you like, but do it while kids are up. One watches kids, then the other. It's a very specific rule. Me and my husband, we have four kids. That was in the 80s. All I time was about them. Now that they are growing and have their own family, me and him have some our time. We love being and around each other, but like he wishing TV and working. I like being at home alone. And when we at home, we talk about everything. And then like I said, he in one room and I am in another. We be merrier for 40s years, get along just fine. I think she's on my side here. I'm not 100% sure though. If you love somebody, you'll expect to have its company as much as they can. It seems like there are two kinds of negative responses to this. There's the people who misinterpret it to mean that they don't want to spend any time together, even though that's not at all what they're saying. This is what, like an hour of their day, some of the time, relax. But then there's also the people who use TikToks like this to just brag about their own relationship. Sad, we like to be with each other at bedtime, even after nine years of marriage. <laughs> Wait, you guys have alone time? That's a choice that you make. No, that's great. I'm happy for you. I guess it's just that you must not love each other very much because I spend every waking moment with my wife. We have the same job, the same hobbies, the same friend, us. Our bathroom has two toilets and they face each other. A few years back, I actually took a class on how to stop blinking and now I don't do it anymore. What can I say? I guess I missed her too much when my eyes were closed. Of course, there's a balance to this, as this guy will tell you, not realizing that the people who posted the TikTok would probably agree with him. If you never prioritize your partner and you're constantly blowing them off to just do whatever you want, go hang out with your friends, that's a problem. If 100% of the time you'd rather be hanging out with your boys than paying any attention to your girlfriend, you probably shouldn't be dating her you should be dating your boy. But at the same time, I wouldn't personally want to be in a relationship where my life solely revolves around the other person. You need time to cultivate your own interests and work on yourself so you actually have something to bring to the table. And honestly, sometimes when your partner is trying to minimize your other passions or turn you against your friends, it's kind of a manipulation tactic. They're trying to make you fully dependent on them so you have nowhere else to go and no one else in your life to point out all their red flags. I don't think a relationship should be about merging into one entity that is useless without the other person. Because if you get too far into it, you're gonna lose sight of who you were before you started dating. Just like with anything though, it comes down to what you and your partner agree on. If you both wanna spend 24 hours a day holding hands and staring into each other's eyes, go for it. That's awesome, I'm not gonna stop you. But that's what really gets me about these comments is that for the most part, everybody's just arguing for their own personal preference in a relationship that they're not a part of. If you see a video like this and you think, well, that wouldn't work for me, or my wife and I could never do something like that, that's literally fine because you're not in the relationship. Like, I just don't understand the need to go around imposing the rules of your marriage onto everyone else. Like, what's the point of even trying to argue with how this couple lives their lives? They've been together for 13 years. If this lifestyle was unsustainable for them, they wouldn't have been able to sustain it. If you see this couple happily on the same page about something and then decide that actually you know what's best for them more than they do, no, you don't. Shut up. In classic internet fashion though, I found another TikTok that's almost exactly the same as these ones, but all of the comments are angry for the opposite reason. After our kids go to bed, this is how my husband and I have been spending time together at night. I am re-watching all the Marvel movies and my husband Chaos. is over here racing in his racing simulator. <laughs> So we're like kind of together, right? Now I'll admit the vibe is a little different in this one. Whereas the other people were like proudly saying, hey, this is something we do. This is what works in our relationship. Uh, this woman seems a little bit more unsure. It also kind of looks like maybe she's been crying, but I don't know her life. I'm just gonna assume that it was from the movie. Ultimately, I don't know. And I'm not gonna speculate on it too hard because this is an Instagram reel and I don't know anything about these people is what I would say if I wasn't a crazy person. She just wants him to do what she wants to do. Yeah, she's not happy. Something's going on. She is low-key putting him down. Instead of just talking to her husband, instead she tries to make a video and post it trying to shame him. Did you cry a little less? Have you offered or shown any interest in playing games with him, reach into his interests? I understand that you are not enjoying this quality time, visually obvious. Now, the thing that these comments all have in common is that they're all working off of an assumption. We have decided that this video is not sincere, and since that's now a fact that we all can agree on, it's okay to bully you for it. So I was curious, I found them on TikTok, I just saw this one on Instagram, and they made multiple follow-up videos where they had to be like, guys, can you stop 
telling us to get a divorce. Like, we love each other. We love our kids. We spend a lot of time together. I was just kind of tired because we both worked all day. And you guys are looking into this way too hard. Please stop. It's weird. Okay, so mystery solved, right? Um, and now that we have that context, I would like to present to you one of the most unhinged comments I have ever read in my life. I am certain that the purpose of this video was we've got this whole history and all I'm asking for him is to sit here and watch these movies with me. I even put on Marvel movies because he likes him and I want to bait him over here to spend time with me because he never spends time with me after all that we've been through. I don't even care about Marvel movies. Right, because Marvel movies are for boys and women can't like superheroes. I'm just making sacrifices to stop enjoying my life, not doing things I want to do or grow as a person, have a hobby, all for him to just pay me the slightest bit of attention. No one appreciates sacrifices they didn't ask for. Do what you want to do. If that doesn't feel like quality time, speak up. If you feel like this relationship is costing everything you want from life, speak up. Otherwise, shut up. Holy shit. We're not even halfway through, by the way. And if you do speak up and that's not what he wants, it's okay to move on with your life. If you feel like you could do better and deserve more, go reach for it. But don't go crawling back just because you don't like the new life you have after you've thrown away your old one and destroyed all semblance of peace for yourself and your family. Stop wasting your time doing things that don't make you happy. You literally have this one life and you're choosing to cry on TikTok rather than make a meaningful difference. Obviously, he's happy and comfortable the way it is. And if you divorce him, he'll probably just enjoy more of his free time after a fucked up dark period of feeling worthless and that nothing that he does is enough because that's what you're saying here. Nothing that has happened before was enough for you. Absolute insanity aside, he based this entire rant on the assumption that she's pretending to like the movies. Like, you never stop to think, hmm, what if this thing I'm making up isn't actually true? That would kind of destroy my entire argument and make me look like an asshole. Nah, I'll do it anyway. Isn't it fun though that the internet is so used to just yelling at each other all the time that you can post two videos with essentially the same thesis and cause a riot for two opposite reasons? Social media is so fun. I'm having a great time. Now, if you're anything like me, seeing all of this unasked for discourse kind of makes you never want to post any private information about yourself because people are just going to use it to bully you or speculate on your behalf. You might even think to post a TikTok where you're like, hey, my partner doesn't post about me on social media, but that doesn't mean the relationship doesn't work because he loves me in real life. And that's really all that matters to me. Only to find out that even that's wrong too. God, and don't even get me started on parenting TikTok. I would never in a million years post a video of my child because I'm just gonna get a bunch of comments from people telling me that I'm doing everything wrong. Like you'll see a video of a kid falling down, right? I'm not saying I seek those kind of videos out or anything. It's just sometimes they pop up and I watch them, okay? But the kid will fall down, right? And the mom will be like, oh no, are you okay? And someone will comment, wrong. Let her get up on her own or she'll never learn how to be independent. And then you'll see the same kind of video where the parent will instead be like, hey buddy, you're, you're fine, just shake it off. Wrong, she's clearly hurt. You were supposed to keep her safe and you failed, and now she'll never trust anyone, and it's all your fault. It's like, okay, what am I supposed to do then? Because it doesn't seem like anything is right to you guys. What's ironic about this though, is I feel like a lot of these kind of commenters are the same people who will shame young people for not having kids yet. Come on guys, be useful to society, give birth already and then post about them so we can nitpick all of your choices. Really though, that's just like the whole internet right now. No matter what kind of content you're making, no matter what you're doing, you'll just be living your life and then someone will be like, um, that's not how I would do it. Well, I didn't ask, buddy. Now the last video I wanna point out has some pretty insane discourse, uh, partly because I found it on Twitter. I mean, in general, when a TikTok gets reposted to Twitter, it's not usually like, hey, look at this funny TikTok I found. It's like, hey, look at this piece of shit I found. We should set their house on fire. Day one of being a stay-at-home husband. Made us some tea and cuddled on the couch. And then I started to pack her lunch before she went to work with all her favorite foods. Snuck in a love note, drove her to work. You get the idea, you know? It's a guy who loves his wife and is clearly doing a good job of taking care of her. They seem to be in a healthy, happy relationship. Not really anything to judge, right? This is more disturbing than gore. In what universe is that a superior life to living alone? It's a terrible lesbian couple. Okay, I lost it at the Beyond Me jerky. I'm sorry, was there like a meeting they all went to 
where they all decided one day that all the guys like this on Twitter have to change their profile picture to some random dead guy statue? What does it mean? Every time you see someone on Twitter with a profile picture like this, I promise you they're about to say the worst take you've ever heard. The only thing gay here is using a straw at home. Fellas. Is it gay to drink stuff? Have you noticed that like everything has discourse now? Everything is a debate, even if it doesn't need to be. And some of it is constructive. Of course, some of it is very much worth having, but then I'll see people arguing about like which basketball player is having a better season or how much cream you're supposed to put in your coffee. Like the fate of the world is on the line. I feel like there's this anger that's seeped into every part of the internet and it's so hard to avoid without just staying off of it altogether. Like you'll see the most innocuous comments in the world that for some reason has 97 replies and you're like, huh, what happened here? And the most recent reply will be like, no, I'm not the one defending genocide. You're the one. And it's like, huh, how did they, what? Who even brought that up? And I think what really sucks about it is so much of it is by design. Like there were those documents that came out that showed Facebook's algorithm was more likely to suggest something if a lot of people were using the angry reaction emoji. And then outside of Facebook on Twitter, I've noticed that a lot of times the tweet at the top of a thread is not the one with the most likes, but the one with the most replies because it's the most controversial. It is the most likely way to stretch out the amount of time you spend on that thread because now instead of just the one original paragraph, there's now dozens of insane ramblings for you to scroll through. Even Instagram is starting to show some of the worst comments near the top. That's how I found the ones in this video. I wasn't scrolling to the bottom. They were at the top. And it's all because a computer told them that these kind of comments increase engagement. Let's not worry about what kind of engagement. Let's not worry about the fact that this specific kind of engagement actually makes people feel like shit and they're worse off when they leave the app than they were when they came onto the app. And not only is this making the overall user experience more negative, but by showing the hateful comments comments to more people because you know that that's what will get them to interact with it. Aren't you like actively encouraging people to write hateful things? Like most of the time, if someone's being an asshole online, they're just doing it to rile people up. They're doing it to get a response. And if the algorithms did a better job of flagging and suppressing those things, and maybe after a while, those people would be like, hmm, it seems my efforts are fruitless. This is no way to spend my days. I need to get my shit together. And then they like put on a suit and tie. But from like the user side, our side, I don't really know what the answer is besides just like spending less time on the internet. It just sucks though, cause sometimes it's really fun, you know? Sometimes I don't get pissed off at all. I just laugh a lot. I like the internet. I like connecting with people across the world. I like finding new talented creators and following them and seeing what kind of stuff they make. There's so much good out there. I just, I wish it wasn't so depressing sometimes. Anyway, for all the people who have sat through this whole rant and didn't care cause they don't really listen to me when I talk and they only watch these videos to see the ad read at the end, you're in luck because today's video is sponsored by Factor. I've started doing a lot more meal prepping the past few months in an attempt to be slightly healthier as a person, and there are plenty of cons that go with it. For one, there's the time investment. If you're trying to count calories, it's not just the buying the food and doing all the cooking, but weighing everything out so you have equal portions. Even worse though is the lack of variety. Sure, I can make one big meal on a Sunday and eat it for lunch the next five days, but then I'm committed to eating the same thing all week. By the time Wednesday rolls around, I'm already tired of it. And I still got three more in my fridge. So I started using Factor so I could stay on track with my health goals without sacrificing on variety and flavor. And the meals have been so good that Amanda is now stealing them from me. Thanks a lot, guys. Designing a meal plan around your dietary preferences is super easy. Whether you want something vegan or keto, low calorie, high protein, they've got 34 different chef prepared meals to choose from every week. You can even throw in a smoothie or two if you want. I'm not your boss. Not only is Factor cheaper than takeout, but it's microwave ready in just a couple of minutes so it'll be nice and hot before you're even done picking out the YouTube video that you're gonna watch while you eat it. And I know what you might be thinking, Drew, what about HelloFresh? You have like a whole thing with them. And that's the thing, I'm doing both. Once for lunch, once for dinner. At this rate, I'll never have to step foot inside a grocery store ever again. My plan is working. Factor is America's number one ready to eat meal kit. And if you wanna try it out for yourself, head to factor75.com and use my promo code DREW50 for 50% off your first box. Again, there's 50% off your first box with code DREW50, Drew being my name, of course, and 50 being the number of percentage off that the price is. That was the only way I could have said that. Thank you so much, Factor, for sponsoring today's video and saving me time that I didn't have to cook. Well, guy, I forgot to write an outro. Hope you have a good week weekend. Or 
I actually don't know what I'm, but I might be posting this on like a Wednesday. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna go do jumping jacks outside of a gym uh, until they are so impressed that they give me a free membership. Bye. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. And also there are some spoilers for Breaking Bad and Succession and also the original Star Wars. Hey guys, welcome back to my Webkins account. As always, this video is entirely inspired by one Curtis Connor tweet. If you go on YouTube and search for best acting compilation, what you'll probably see is a lot of videos with millions of views that look and sound kind of like this. Hey, lazy, I make you hate you. Yes, yes, yes. While most of these scenes are incredible, I think it's kind of silly that we tend to view yelling loudly or crying on camera to be the epitome of a performance. Maybe it's just that anger and sadness are the two most relatable human emotions, or maybe it's cathartic when you have some amount of pent up frustration to see an actor go absolutely apeshit on a mirror. But there are so many other types of acting that are just as important as the climactic rage outbursts that tend to fly under the radar. One of the biggest ones is just reacting. What are you doing? doing while other people are talking? Are you visibly affected by what they're saying or are you just waiting for your turn to talk again? It doesn't matter that you nailed all your lines if you just stand there with a blank expression while everyone else is giving theirs. Not only are you gonna ruin whatever shot you happen to be in, but you just made it that much harder for your scene partner to focus on what they're saying. Subtle reaction shots can be just as powerful or devastating as the line that they're reacting to. That's what adds any meaning to those words. When you think about it, it doesn't really matter what someone says in a scene if the person they're saying it to doesn't give a shit? The gravity of words is the impact they have, not necessarily just the words themselves. If something is meant to be a big reveal, but the other person doesn't seem at all shocked, then kind of ruined the surprise, didn't it? I think one reason a show like Succession is so captivating to me is because of how into it every actor is, no matter who's talking. In fact, the show is purposely shot in a way so the actors never know for certain when they might be in frame, so they need to be constantly invested. Some of the cameramen are given free reign to move around the room and zoom in on whoever they want. This makes it so even when only a couple people in a scene are talking, you still know how everyone else feels because you can see it on their face. It's fun in a lot of ways, this is a show about words. It's about clever insults and very deliberate dialogue. Some of the best lines I've ever heard have come from this show. You can't make a tomlet without breaking some Greggs. But in spite of that, a lot of the most compelling moments are entirely nonverbal. Whether it's Shiv silently seething at the end of season three, Logan giving the most subtle smirk at the end of season two, or the many looks on Kendall's face as he goes through an absolute roller coaster of gaining and losing power, the extreme highs and lows of his drug addiction, all while grappling with the guilt he feels for doing something awful at the end of season one. And look, this is all just my opinion. I'm not a trained actor by any means. The most acting I do is in the little skits that I put in my videos. But for me, it is always so much harder to do a reaction shot than it is to give a line. Because when I'm talking, I'm actively doing something. I have words to say. I can focus on what I'm saying and how to say them. But if I have to just like, give a surprised look or look like I'm sad about something that's happening out of frame, it just doesn't come naturally at all. I have to do it a hundred times before I can narrow it down to one not terrible take. So because of my own shortcomings, I'm often just as impressed when people give a really good facial expression in a scene as I am, you know, when someone gives like a really cool monologue. Going back to what I talked about in the beginning, rage is something that can be even more interesting when the actor's trying to hold it back, not necessarily just explode on everyone. Jack Nichols Nicholson in The Shining, before he goes sicko mode on his whole family, makes it very clear without even saying a word that he is actively snapping. This face is terrifying. He doesn't have to say anything here. He doesn't have to be charging you with an ax. I am scared looking at this. And all he's doing is making a face. That's incredible. Nonverbal acting goes hand in hand with physical acting. And for a really long time, I kind of rolled my eyes at the idea of physical comedy because when I thought about it, I just thought about Lele Pond falling down. And technically, yes, that counts, but there's so much more to physicality. Uh, the way your character walks, you know, that's a choice. Whether it's Michael Sarah embodying an entire personality with this defeated slouch, or uh, it's kind of weird, the boss from Emily in Paris. I know it's a terrible show, but I am fascinated by this actress's choice to always walk around with like T-Rex arms. And then it hit me. Powerful people are always 
pointing at stuff. Rachel, I love your haircut. Matthew? No smoking in here, can't you read the sign? And so, you know, I guess it's more convenient to keep your hands up here. Always ready to point. Okay, a better example of physicality that I love. Kieran Culkin as Roman Roy. There is a scene where he accidentally sends a dick pic to his father during a work meeting. His acting in the rest of this episode is so beautiful. Not because of anything he says. Honestly, I don't remember a single word of dialogue from this, but I will always remember the way he shrinks into his chair. The way his face contorts and his eyes well up. You can see him actively trying to escape his body. Like maybe if he curls up enough, his body will fold into itself and disappear. But he can't. He's stuck and all of the smugness and arrogance that has built up for him over the course of the season is whisked away in a matter of seconds. Depending on what role you have, physicality could also be your ability to dance or do action sequences. Obviously not the ones with stunt doubles, you know, the ones where they see your face, so you gotta do it yourself. Not every actor is good at everything and you can't just sub someone in for one scene, so it's no small feat when someone is able to check every box. I think there's a lot of roles you can look at through this lens and maybe view differently. Like it's easy to say, that Hayden Christensen pooped the bed in the Star Wars prequels because of how robotically all of his lines were delivered. But in his defense, I think a lot of that had more to do with George Lucas's inability to write regular human dialogue. The dialogue was a little bit difficult. I remember there was one line that I just begged him to take out of the screenplay, and he finally did. My line was, but we can't turn back. Fear is their greatest defense. I doubt if the actual security there is any greater than it was on Aquilae or Solus, and what there is is most likely directed towards a large-scale assault. <laughs> and I thought, who talks like this, George? A lot of Hayden's physical acting was really good. The choreographed fights, uh, some of his facial expressions, where you could really see on his face the internal conflict that he's dealing with. And you maybe even start to feel some empathy. Uh, the problem is, you know, then he goes on the whole sand rant and he kind of kills the vibe. But did he write that? No, George wrote that. And George managed to make Natalie Portman look like a bad actress, and she won an Oscar like five years after this movie, so I don't think that's on her. Suddenly I'm afraid. A similar character, but on the opposite end of the spectrum for me, is Tobey Maguire. Like probably a hundred million other people, I recently went back and rewatched the Sam Raimi trilogy, and I had always thought Tobey was really good in these movies. But watching it now, I realized, you know, he's really good at playing Peter Parker, He's not very good at playing Spider-Man. The dude pulls off the sad, lonely nerd character like nobody's business. But when he's not crying or actively becoming a meme, he kind of always talks the same. He always talks really quietly for some reason. Look at little Goblin Jr. I'm gonna avenge Uncle Ben. And I'm gonna kill Eric Foreman. Not to beat a dead horse, because obviously a ton of people have talked about why Spider-Man 3 was a disappointment, but in order for a trilogy like this to work, there needs to be more growth exhibited from the main character. And I just don't know if Toby as an actor was capable of doing that. Last Star Wars example, I promise. But to me, the gold standard of this will always be Mark Hamill. You ever go back and watch the very first Star Wars? Luke Skywalker is a little bitch in this movie. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. And then a couple years later, he's gone through some transformative experiences. <laughs> and he's a total badass. He's cool as hell. If he was the same stinky little goofball the whole time, it would have ruined the series. Imagine if instead of showing up to fight Emperor Palpatine with a shiny new robot hand and a shit ton of confidence, he just like grew out his hair a little bit and moped in the corner. I'll take down the empire when you fix this damn door. In short, a lot of actors are good at some things, but very few are versatile enough to be good at everything. And that brings me to Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston has played two of my favorite characters in two of my favorite shows, won awards doing both, and they could not be more different. Having watched Malcolm in the Middle like a hundred times, I always thought that I wouldn't be able to take Breaking Bad seriously because I would only be able to see Hal. Hal is a total pushover. He's scared of everything. He gets really fixated on random obsessions. And in spite of his good intentions, he always tends to make situations worse. But more than anything else, he just loves his family, especially his wife, and it's one of the most wholesome and endearing characters on TV. Lois, that boy needs a father figure, and I really think it should be me. Walter White is 
not. Brian's physical comedy is so good in Malcolm in the Middle, and he has some signature mannerisms that every once in a while would seep into Walter, but for the most part, these two characters are so different that it doesn't even seem like the same actor. Through an unfortunate series of dominoes, Walter transforms into essentially the main villain of the show, but it's such a slow process that it doesn't feel unnatural. From the beginning, you can see the seeds planted. You can see some of that anger in his eyes, and as his situation gets worse and he does his best to survive it, in order to avoid the danger, he has to become the danger. Walter and the audience, to an extent, can rationalize just about every fucked up thing he does. But there will come a point where you suddenly realize, yeah, I'm not rooting for this guy anymore. <laughs> He's done way too much. He's the Bojack Horseman of drug dealers. A happy ending is possible, but does this guy even deserve it? And that slow, organic shift is really impressive to watch. Uh, not just from the writers, but from Brian Cranston as well. Aside from all the obvious big moments throughout the show, one of my favorite scenes early on was between him and Gretchen, a character played by Jessica Heck. Up until this point, she'd only been in two other episodes. She was barely established on screen. And all we really knew was this vague history between her and Walt. Which makes it all that more impressive the amount of tension they have in this scene. It's like we've been watching them go at it for years, but they've only been on screen together for like 10 minutes up until this point. It's incredible. I feel so sorry for you, Walt. Fuck. You. you ever watch a performance so good that all you can do is laugh? Because your body doesn't know how else to express how that made you feel, so you just let out an involuntary chuckle? This show had so many moments of that for me, from Brian Cranston, Aaron Paul, Bill Allen as scientist. And it's all a good example of how acting, writing, and directing all go hand in hand. There are directors who have made great actors look bad. There's writing that's so clever that just about anyone who delivers the line is gonna seem like a genius. And there's some actors who are so good in a role that it forces the showrunner to reconsider their entire plan. <laughs> Jesse Pinkman was supposed to die in season one, but then Vince Gilligan saw how well Aaron and Brian worked together, and he was like, you know what? Actually, maybe not. And it's a good thing they didn't do that, because by the end of the show, are you really rooting for anyone besides Jesse? All right, so I guess the last topic I want to touch on is this ongoing debate about the validity of method acting. Essentially, method acting is when someone stays in character all the time because they think it'll make them act better. And I don't have too much of a concrete feeling about this either way. I think, generally speaking, whatever works, works. You know, just do the best job you can. But you hear stories about actors who are playing villains so they just treat everyone like shit all the time? Because that's what my character would do. And that's where it's like, okay, maybe you're just using this as an excuse to be a dick. So I always say about people who do method acting, you only ever see people doing the method when they're playing an asshole. <laughs> maybe instead you could do what everyone else does and just do your job and then go home and be normal. I think what it comes down to for me is whether or not the performance you're giving warrants whatever nonsense you're pulling on set. Like, in my opinion, Jeremy Strong is giving the performance of a lifetime as Kendall Roy. But as an actor, he is very much an anomaly on that set with the way he goes through his process. He's notoriously not very fun to be around. He takes everything way too seriously. And there are other incredible actors on set who are able to access a similar level of performance without being a wet blanket. But ultimately, he never seems to cross a line. And if that's what it takes for him to pull this off, then just let the results speak for themselves. But then you have other examples of method acting, like Jared Leto as the Joker, doing insane things to his co-workers because, sorry, Jared's not here right now. This is how the Joker would act. Who did you send used condoms to? Oh, everybody. Yeah, he sent used condoms, sticky Playboy magazines. I can't even begin to tell you the weird things I got. I mean, the Joker is somebody who doesn't really respect things like personal space or boundaries. So he's going around actively being a nuisance to everyone. And to make it worse, his performance wasn't even that good. I don't know if this was worth being an asshole for four months, dude. One thing you'll hear a lot about method actors is the people they worked with on the movie saying, oh, I never met that guy. I only met the character he was playing. And it's like, that's cool, I guess. I, I admire the commitment. But it's one of those things that better work, otherwise the ends do not justify the means. <laughs> anyway, as is the case in all of my stream of consciousness video essays, I don't really know how to end this. 
So let's do a lightning round. Reservation Dogs, one of my favorite new shows. There's such a talented cast, but Sarah Pademski is probably the highlight for me, as well as Moe's and Miko, who are so goddamn funny every time they're on screen. Betsy Brandt is Marie. Holy shit, she nails this character. The overly nosy extended family member who has to know everything and also can't keep a secret. The fact that most people have probably met someone exactly like this is what makes it so good. But if I were to narrow down my Mount Rushmore of acting to just one person, it wouldn't be Brian Cranston or Meryl Streep or Morgan Freeman or Marlon Brando or Adam Driver or the guy who plays Mayhem in the Allstate commercials. It would be him. Kevin, uh, your dog just died. You want to talk about subtlety? You want to talk about some non-verbal acting? That man did not even have to say a word. He barely had to move his face muscles. And yet you can feel the sadness through the screen. I kind of feel like my dog just died. That's sad. I'm crying. Anyway, I think he deserves it. Um, I'm going to be giving him my streamy award because I feel like he's not getting enough appreciation for this and I'm getting too much. I've only posted one video this year and it's about Christmas movies, so I don't deserve this. Anyway, that's all I gotta say about that. If you like this video and you wanna support my channel, stick around while I tell you about today's sponsor. If you're anything like me, there's probably something you've been meaning to learn your entire life, but you keep putting it off because you don't know where to start. And that's where Skillshare comes in. There are two things I am committed to learning in 2022. I wanna learn how to play the bass, and I wanna be able to go on Ableton without getting overwhelmed every time. In theory, I know how it should work, it's just, there's so many buttons. Skillshare is full of in-depth lessons to discover on so many different topics, whether it's something you've been doing for a long time and you wanna take it to the next level, or it's something you're just starting out and you want some guidance on where to begin. They're completely ad-free, so you can stay focused on what you're trying to learn. And new classes are added every single week in addition to the thousands they already have. Classes about photography, video editing, animation, web design, and yes, even acting. Guessing Marilyn Monroe became an acting legend all on her own? No, she was actually Skillshare's very first member, almost 50 years before anyone else joined. For legal reasons, I should probably clarify that that's a joke. Uh, internet was way too slow back then to stream video. If you wanna try out Skillshare for yourself, you're in luck because the first thousand people to click the link in the description and use my promo code DrewGooden will get a one month free trial. Go see for yourself everything they have to offer at Skillshare.com and learn something new this year, baby. I dare you. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. Bad news, guy. Then I got stuck in the dryer. I'm sorry. I don't think I'm gonna be able to film an outro this week. I know for a lot of you that's your favorite part of the video. You usually just skip to the end to see my signature sign off, but given my current situation, I just don't think I'm gonna do that this week. Please don't unsubscribe. I'm trying my very hardest to get out of here and continue running the errands that I had to do today. Anyway, thanks again so much for watching this video. I'll see you next time for a video where I learn how to reverse juggle. Uh, that's when I take a bunch of things that I would juggle and put them away. Bye. Hey guys, welcome back to my second attempt at filming this intro because when I tried to do this yesterday, I forgot to focus the camera. Life can be pretty stressful sometimes. Even when you're not screwing up one of the easiest jobs in the world, you're often faced with important decisions and complex moral dilemmas. And it can be hard to know exactly what to do because things are almost never black and white except in Darman videos. This pizza's frozen cold. I'm not paying for this. Maybe you should get a job delivering pizza. Derek finally understands how difficult it is to have a job. I know how hard your job is. The Darman cinematic universe has a beautifully simplistic view on life where there's always a good guy and a bad guy, there's an obvious solution to every problem, and karma happens immediately. Teacher accuses student of doing drugs instantly regrets Car it. mechanic tries to scam a woman, instantly regrets Customer it. shames fast food worker, instantly regrets Instantly. It. Instantly regret. And when the titles don't end with instantly regrets it, it's what happens next will shock you. Which is funny because every single Darman video is exactly the same, so at this point, I am no longer shocked. If you want this, you're gonna have to get it. From the trash. <laughs> You can get it out of the trash. <laughs> I know I'm a few years late to the Darman party, but I was in need of motivation and didn't know where else to turn. So today, I'd like to watch a few of his videos with you and see if we get inspired or if I instantly regret it. This first one's called Student Cheats on Final Exam. The important words are always capitalized for emphasis. And as you can see, little Michael over here is not paying attention to his classes. Instead, he's poisoning his brain with violent video games. <sighs> 
He took my kill. Shame on you, Michael. I get it though, games are fun, but you're not gonna be able to coast through life multitasking. When you're at work, you focus on your job. And you don't let anything distract you from your job. Damn you, Mr. Mosby. To be fair though, he's obviously a gaming prodigy. Look at how he's able to move his character without even touching his keyboard. And apparently he's bilingual, so I actually think this kid's got a bright future ahead of him. Mr. Wilson's not happy with him though. You know how teachers can be. Hey, Michael, it's showing me that you're on mute and your camera's off. Oh, sorry. My computer was acting up. Wow, a gamer and a liar? Now he's perfect for FaZe Clan. Can you get us the new PS5? How about if you both get A's on your math final? Which is apparently your only class. Then I'll buy it for you. How does that sound? Really? Okay. Well, you may as well buy it for us now, because I'm going to ace that test. Huh. He sure is confident for someone who hasn't been paying any attention. I just hope he's not doing anything nefarious. Check this out. Is this our math final? I found it online, so now I have all the answers. I spoke too soon. He is doing something nefarious. Wait, did I? No, you did not. It's not cheating. It's called taking a shortcut. I mean, how else do you think people succeed in life? By taking the long way? I gotta say though, that was my favorite website growing up. MiddleSchoolMathAnswers.com Of course, the entire page was just this specific final exam, and I never had Mr. Wilson as a teacher, so. Maybe that's why I always failed math. Studying is for losers. Ain't that the truth. Mikey compares the Hello? final exam to all the Who questions on the website. Who's talking and right sure now? Is everything okay? Yes, yeah, I just came by to let you know that Jaden got a 100% on his math final. Hell yeah, my boy Jaden's getting a PS5, which means he can finally play... Well, it's still nice to have. This is great news. If Jaden passed, that means they both got an A, right? Zero percent? This is an F. Huh? That's impossible. I cheated. I studied. Well, as I was saying, Michael got all of his answers correct. If those answers were from this website that I created. That sneaky bastard. I knew middleschoolmathanswers.com was too good to be true. You did? I did. All right, and let's use that same exact shot again. Perfect. There are no shortcuts to success. You have to do things the right way. That must be the lesson of the video because they put it in the script twice. There are no shortcuts to success. You have to do things the right way. Oh, sorry. Three times, actually. That's so unfair. Go to your room now. Just wait till I tell your dad about this. I'm sure he'll be back any day now. As time has gone on, Darman has gotten more and more meta. He loves mentioning people who've made videos about him, like Cody Ko, who actually got to be in one of his videos. Cody's the new cook here. I'm so sorry, man. And it was a very inspiring lesson about the importance of being patient. Look, now I realize that success does require patience. And great things really do take time. Oh, I quit. Dahar also has characters mention himself a lot. Today we will be watching a Darman video. Yes, I love Darman. <laughs> yeah, there's no surprise there. Only nerds and dorks watch Darman. I like how on one hand you have the self-deprecation of someone being like, Darman's for nerds. But then you also have these other characters defend and compliment him. All his videos are dumb. They're not dumb, Billy. They teach important life lessons. Are you watching Drew Gooden videos? Yeah. That guy is a loser. All he does is film himself pooping and farting all day long, edit into a little compilation, and then upload it to his OnlyFans. And I happen to like that. I think Drew Gooden is a very cool guy who seems handsome as well and is smart guy. You're right. He is much awesome, and I couldn't agree more on the handsome part. It actually goes even further than that. You see, in this sketch, Darman is written to be the ultimate celebrity. He is idolized by every single child in this school, except for the bully. Because only losers with no friends watch his videos. That's not true. I watch Starman, I love all his videos. Noah even spends his lunch break watching him on YouTube. Side note, I love that instead of just playing a video on the phone, they made the editor mask it onto the phone frame by frame. As a former video editor myself, I can relate to that all too well. Oh, 
Don't you think we should pull up the video? Ah, don't worry about it. We'll fix it in post. What do you mean, we? What'd you say? Nothing, sorry. And take that paper off. You got it, boss. And when Noah's mom comes to pick him up after a long day of ruthless bullying. Dork! <laughs> Psych! <laughs> she knows just how to make him feel better. Darn man t-shirt. So you see? <laughs> oh, really? Wow. <laughs> Thanks, mom. I love it. That's right, honey. I got you merch. Are you happy now? Yeah, merch make me happy. That's right. Merch can cheer anyone up, even the saddest, loneliest boy. You just have to buy a shirt like me, and then you'll be happy. Link in description. Loser. <laughs> Tell me what's going on. I don't have any friends. Oh. And today, I was but the I laughing stop of the school. You see? Oh, my glasses. Oh, my glasses. So I can't see. There you go. Oh, thanks. Are you okay? That's dormant. Yeah, some kid at school has been really mean to me. Uh, look, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. For... Darman, uh, I, I can't believe it's really you. I'm like your number one fan. I can't believe it. This is the best day of my life. I. Wait, why are you standing outside of a middle school? That's kind of weird. You know, back when I was in school, I didn't even have any friends. Wait, what? You. You did it? That can't be true. You're Darman. You're the coolest guy ever. We worship you. What's so funny? Darman? Dar Dar In this universe, you are literally our god. You gave birth to us. Thanks, Noah. I really appreciate that. And you know what? I think you're so cool. I even made you your own limited edition merch. Holy shit. It's a real shirt. I can really buy it. I can't believe this. I I'm gonna go put this on right now. <laughs> I guess my work here is done. If you guys need me, I will be standing in the parking lot, uh, just kind of lurking there. So. It's funny when you start to notice how formulaic every video is to a T. There's always a scene near the beginning where the adult finds a reason to leave the room so the kids can be mean to each other in peace. I have to get this. I'll be back. Just give me one minute. I gotta take this. Next, we're gonna hear from... Sorry, guys, I do have to take this uh no one is calling me i just have to take my phone outside and while they're gone one of the kids will throw out the most basic uncreative insult at the nerd and everyone else will laugh hysterically you don't have any friends <laughs> stop it P P paula it's not nice to be how are you going to beat me when you can't even say a simple word stuttering steven <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say, the set pieces in these videos are immaculate. Even though this classroom sort of looks like your brain's vague interpretation of one while in a dream, it almost seems real with such details as the name of the school on the whiteboard. My teachers would always do that too, just in case we forgot where we were. In this one, Steven and Paula are going head to head in the race for class president. Because I'm popular and I'm pretty. It's a real David vs. Goliath story. I love their campaign slogans. Vote for Steven to end bullying. Or vote for Princess Paula because I'm the most popular. Her famous quote. So that's why I think you should vote for me. I'm popular, I'm pretty, plus I'll make sure we have less homework and more movies. These kids have really lofty goals as class presidents. Steve wants to arrest all the bullies and Paula's gonna ban homework. Do middle school class presidents actually do anything? Because I feel like this plot is sort of built on the notion that whoever wins is going to be sitting behind a desk all day passing executive orders. No, no, no. I said pizza for lunch every day. I guess now that I think about it, the title could be interpreted pretty ominously. Kids make fun of boy and live to regret it. Sounds like he might hire the middle school secret service to take care of anyone who called him Stuttering Steven, which, by the way, is a top tier nickname. And one that's definitely worthy of the laughter that ensues each time it's said. Stuttering Steven, Stuttering Steven, Stuttering Steven. <laughs> This is another one of my favorite Darman tropes. In the last video, Noah was a nerd, so the bully called him. Noah the nerd. <laughs> and then there was one with a poor kid named Gordon who bought his clothes from Goodwill. See you later, Goodwill Gordon. <laughs> Goodwill Gordon. And then there's another bullying video about a girl in a wheelchair named Wendy, and this one's kind of tough, so I'm gonna give you a few minutes to think about it. What do you think her nickname is? Wheelchair Wendy? <laughs> I 
don't know how he comes up with this stuff. Homeless Heather. <laughs> Jordan the janitor. <laughs> this time it's Wendy who's getting made fun of because we've been transported into the Darman universe where everyone is a bully except for the nerds and people with disabilities. Would one of you mind helping me reach that? Just because your legs don't work doesn't mean your arms don't work. She just keeps on roasting Wendy for absolutely no reason and expects Noah, that's right, we got another Noah. There's Noah, he's so hot. She expects him to laugh along because he's the football quarterback guy. And that's what football quarterback guys do, but he doesn't. So she's confused until she learns. Why do you keep sticking up for her? Because I know what it feels like to be in her shoes. A few years ago, I took a really bad hit. The doctor told me that I wouldn't be able to walk for a really long time. But do you know what hurt even more? How other people would treat me. They'd stop and stare. Really? He's like, <laughs> Did you hear about Noah? He suffered a major spinal injury that could leave him paralyzed for the rest of his life. Oh my god. That is very funny to me. To me as well, I am laughing at that. I know what it feels like to be in a wheelchair. And Wendy doesn't deserve to be treated that way. So, is the point that if he hadn't experienced that, then the bullying would be okay? Is the lesson that you can only be nice to someone if you can relate to them? Because it almost sounds like Noah would be laughing at Wendy if he hadn't personally been in a wheelchair himself, which I think is kind of flawed logic. You could be nice to someone just because. That's kind of how all these videos go. Another one of my favorites is the trope of the rich kid making fun of the poor kid. And then the parents of the rich kid are like, hey, you need to walk a mile in their shoes. And then they do. And they're like, wow, I never knew it was so hard to be poor. I was spoiled. Joey takes out an old tablet since his mom took away his new one. Everyone laughs and makes him feel really bad. I like how in this one, it's established that the Minecraft shirts are new and cool, but the Animal Crossing is so last year. No way! Look at what you're wearing! Is that last year's Animal Crossing t-shirt? Yeah. Why? Oh! No one plays that anymore. We'll play Minecraft. Minecraft's been around since like 2012. Those could be very old shirts. It is hard to completely make fun of these videos. They can be pretty cringy and the music is always comically intense. <laughs> oh, you have seven <laughs> followers on Instagram <laughs> and you want to be a YouTuber. But the intentions are good, so I can't be mad about that. I'm sure there were at least a couple of kids who watched one of these and came away more empathetic towards someone than they were before, and that's great. They're also weirdly addicting to watch because even though you know what's gonna happen at the end of all of them, they always write the bully to be so unlikable that you kinda wanna stick around for their inevitable comeuppance. Never judge a book by its cover. <laughs> uh, ooh, would you look at that? A woman who knows nothing about cars. As a woman, you may not be able to understand all this. She's a woman for crying out loud. I know as a woman, you probably don't know much about cars. I actually know a lot about cars. You're fired. I guess what I'm trying to say is, Darman, keep up the good work. YouTube just wouldn't be the same without you. And also, please cast me in one of your videos. I could pretend to be a cook. I could knock over an egg, just give me a shot. Small disclaimer, I do live in Florida. You're gonna have to fly out to me. I will not come to you. That's non-negotiable, those are my terms. Needless to say, this has been a very inspiring afternoon. I think I'm finally feeling like myself again. And if there's one thing I know myself would do, it would be a brand deal. You know how when people can't dance, they say they have two left feet? Well, when it comes to cooking, I have two left hands. But with today's sponsor, HelloFresh, I get three delicious meals delivered to my door every week with fresh pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step -step instruction cards that I can stare at for as long as it takes to figure it out. My wife and I have been subscribing to them for a couple years now, long before they even started sponsoring my channel, which is one of the reasons I was so excited to work with them because it's a product I've actually used and believe in. The food is great and I love that three meals are already taken care of every week, which saves me a trip to the store. I like trying new recipes I find online, but 
I can't tell you how much time I've wasted walking down like six different aisles trying to find one specific ingredient only to realize they don't even sell it here because I accidentally went to Home Depot. There are a ton of customization options with HelloFresh, whether you're a vegetarian or a pescatarian or you're looking for low carb meals, they've got you covered. I love going on the app and seeing what we're gonna get, swapping meals out if I wanna try something new, or adding a batch of garlic bread because it literally goes with everything. So if you wanna try it out for yourself and see why they're America's number one meal kit, go to HelloFresh.com and use my promo code I'm a little stinker 14 for 14 free meals, including free shipping. Again, that's I'm a little stinker 14. An easy way to remember that is that it was my MySpace bio in 2007. Thank you so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video instead of baking me into a cake. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you liked it, please don't say anything because it's gonna go straight to my head. And if you didn't like it, Please also don't say anything because it's gonna go straight to my heart. Be sure to tune in first thing tomorrow morning for a brand new video where I take all of my other videos and put a laugh track over them. Bye. I'm fully committed to be the best me in 2023. That means a recommitment to my health and well being. No excuses. That means eating healthy and going to the gym. That means getting plenty of sleep and reducing stress. That means visiting the team at Popeye Supplements for expert advice and products to accelerate results and keep me on track. Hey guys, welcome back to another video where I say a bunch of numbers and like three jokes. Sorry in advance, this isn't gonna be one of my wacky silly videos where I put on a clown suit and get bonked in the head. Uh, I wanna talk about something that's been on my mind a lot lately. So one of the many byproducts of everything that's gone on this year is that food delivery apps are killing it. Turns out when you don't wanna leave your home, it's pretty convenient to have a different person deliver meals straight to your door and into your mouth. I've certainly fallen into that trap a number of times, even before this year. Picture this relatable scenario. It's almost 3 p.m. You should have eaten lunch already, but you haven't because you got caught up in work, so you're starving. I think a burrito sounds good. I'll just do Chipotle. I know if I run in and pick it up, it'll only be like eight bucks, but I really don't have time for that today, so let's do delivery. All right, I got the bowl. Add 395 to avoid small cart fee. Fair enough, I don't wanna have to pay another fee, so let's do chips and guac. I'm pretty hungry. All right, everything looks good and it is $21. That's not even including the tip, so it's actually gonna be closer to $30 for one person ordering fast food. You know what, I'm being greedy here. I don't need the chips. I'll go ahead and take those off and that'll bring our total all the way down to $19 because the small cart fee is just a little bit less than the chips and guac were. And that's not even mentioning the fact that all of the base item prices are marked up from what they would be in the store. Here's the same exact order from the same location, but through Chipotle's website. Everything on here is more expensive, but sometimes in a way where you don't even notice. Now, in general, I would say I'm definitely on board with spending a little bit more for the sake of convenience. It's one of the simple joys you get as an adult, the whole treat yourself mentality. Spending more than you have to on something and pretending it doesn't bother you, hell, that's what life is all about. But if I can, I do wanna to try to make sure that extra money is going to the right place. Giving a big tip is always nice because I know that's going straight to the person who needs it and who's working hard to earn it. Paying a delivery fee, a small cart fee, and a nebulous service fee, which can add up to almost double the cost of the meal and all go to a company that's acting only as the middleman, is not nice. And that's all working under the assumption that the service itself is actually good. How many times have you tried to Postmate something and they mess up your order, or it arrives cold, or they send it to the wrong address, mark it as delivered, and then your neighbor won't answer the door when you go and ask for it back? I wish that number was zero but wishes don't always come true. Food delivery apps are an unbelievably expensive service that also happen to be very bad most of the time. But at least your order is helping support a local restaurant during a tumultuous time, right? Well, yes. Sort of. Because for all the service fees and extra charges that get thrown onto the customer, almost none of that goes back to the restaurant itself. In fact, the number varies from city to city and depending on which app you're using, but some restaurant owners have reported that DoorDash has charged as much as 40% commission on orders placed through their app. As it is, restaurant margins are extremely thin. You have food costs, employees to pay, a building to rent. It's just a really difficult industry to succeed in, and when these middleman delivery apps come in and take a huge cut, it can be devastating. Now at this point, I think the reasonable response that a lot of people have is, well, okay, if these delivery apps are so bad to work with, if they take such a big cut, why do the restaurants keep using them? 
And it's because they have to. Unfortunately, right now, there's not really a valid alternative. You either give all of your profits to Uber Eats or you risk going out of business. The owner of a barbecue place in California says he simply can't afford to hire his own drivers, but 80% of his orders are now delivery, so he's kind of in a bind. I think it is worth noting that these delivery apps do add a lot of visibility and marketing to local restaurants. I've discovered several great food spots around me just by browsing DoorDash. That in itself can be very valuable. Another benefit is that any mishaps that happen with the order can be handled through the third party app. So the restaurants who are already busy fulfilling other orders don't have to worry about processing refunds. When you get the wrong food delivered to your house, you usually just contact Postmates and they resolve it directly. However, and this is a good point I read in this article, in that situation, you're probably more likely to blame the restaurant than you are the delivery app, even if it wasn't the restaurant's fault. And even though they made a mistake, you'll probably keep using Grubhub. You'll just never order from that restaurant again, especially if it was your first time trying them out. Also, due to the lack of communication between the apps and the restaurants, DoorDash doesn't know when a store has run out of a certain product. So you'll have customers that try to order a brisket and think they've done so successfully until 15 minutes later they get a call from the restaurant telling them they're sold out. Again, in that situation, they're more likely to be frustrated with the restaurant, even if it was DoorDash's fault. So there are both benefits and downsides to doing business through these apps. But like I said, the restaurants just really don't have a choice Choice right now. And the apps are very well aware of this because back in March and April, many of them took advantage of that desperation by hiking commission fees, which led to lawsuits and eventually lawmakers stepping in to impose caps in certain states. And if you can believe it, that wasn't even the first time DoorDash has done something exploitative. Last year, they got a lot of backlash for using customer tips to subsidize a driver's pay. In other words, if a dasher was going to make $6 off an order and then you tip them $5, they'd still make $6, but your tip just came out of what DoorDash was going to pay them. So in a way, you're almost tipping DoorDash itself there, even though their tipping policy is that 100% of a tip goes directly to the driver. Just another example of how sometimes words can be both true and totally false at the same time. I think they have since changed this policy. I saw articles saying they did, but I've still seen recent comments from drivers mentioning this, so I'm not actually 100% sure. Regardless, it's always better to try and tip in person with cash if you can, because it'll maximize how much the drivers are getting paid, and we're trying to support them here, not the giant corporation. Here's something crazy though, in spite of the fact that they charge these exorbitant fees and come up with very creative ways to dish out as little money as possible, DoorDash has still lost $150 million this year. I'm almost in disbelief as to how that's possible, but I guess they're taking a page out of Hard Rock Nick's playbook. You gotta spend money to lose money. <laughs> and back on the topic of delivery drivers, it seems like each app has its own pros and cons that can make it frustrating or even less profitable to work with. And even with all the resources available online, it's pretty hard to figure out which one is the best. Postmates just not cutting it. Okay, so Postmates is the worst one. With all things said, Postmates is the official winner. I mean, Postmates is the best one. Number one is DoorDash. Or sorry, no, DoorDash is the best one. This is my first experience with DoorDash. Eh, it was all right. Uh, the best one at sucking, I meant. It's actually very Bad. I like uh, DoorDash a lot better. DoorDash is very good. I'm actually getting pretty frustrated with DoorDash. Oh no! DoorDash for the win. That's true. It seems like the most consistent issues that drivers have is the lack of transparency coming from the app. Whether it's not knowing how much you're gonna make from each order or how the commission structure is even split up, it can also be even more annoying than that. Like for a long time, Uber Eats wouldn't tell the driver where they had to deliver the food until they had already accepted the order and gotten to the restaurant. So then you might end up driving for like 40 minutes just to make enough money to pay for the gas you spent on that trip. And then with DoorDash, Another issue seems to be that unless it's busy in your area, you can't just hop in your car and start driving. You have to schedule your hours in advance, which can be not ideal. <laughs> and it removes one of the main appeals of working for these companies, which is the flexibility. And on top of everything else, since these are such massive companies, it can be extremely difficult for drivers to get in contact with the company they work for. Postmates seems to be the most notorious for this. Sometimes a driver will go to pick up an order from a restaurant only to find out it's closed. And instead of paying them at least something for their time, like the other apps do, Postmates is just like, sorry. Well, what are you waiting for? Go pick something else up. In a perfect world, restaurants wouldn't have to turn to these third-party apps to handle this side of their business, and they could just afford to pay drivers directly and give them more benefits and better pay than what they get from like Grubhub. But that's just not realistic. Even the apps that do deliver don't usually have a slick app that you can order on in a couple minutes. You gotta call them and talk to a person on the phone and they can barely hear you because there's kitchen noise behind them. So you hope they get everything right, but you won't be 100% sure until it shows up at your door. 
Discord. I get why people prefer the apps. Convenience is very convenient. But one recommendation I do have, if you're trying to find a new place to eat and you want to find something local, open up Postmates, go on the DoorDash app, see if you find something you like, and then Google that restaurant and see if they have a website. Who knows, maybe they're just down the street and you can go pick it up, or maybe they do delivery themselves. There's a sushi place near us that started doing delivery back in April, and it's perfect because they get all of the money that we give them, and we save money because we're not paying random service fees. I will say though to be careful when you're Googling because some of these apps have actually paid a lot of money to make it seem like going through them is the only way you can get delivery from certain restaurants. But sometimes after just a few more seconds of searching, you'll find a better alternative that the restaurant restaurant actually prefers you use because it won't eat into their profits. These delivery apps rely on us doing as little thinking as possible. They know that we just want to click like three times so we can spend the next 20 minutes watching a little car drive on a map towards our house. But sometimes that fourth click will cut them out of the equation altogether and that's better for everyone. I know that none of what I said here was groundbreaking information. Everybody knows that delivery apps charge too much and aren't always the best to work for. I guess the point I'm really trying to make with this video is that it's such a weird industry because it's absolutely absolutely necessary and yet no one's really benefiting from it. The consumers need it, which is why we're willing to pay extra service fees. The restaurants need it, which is why they're willing to pay extra service fees. And the delivery apps profit off both of those things while somehow still losing millions of dollars every month. Maybe a lot of this will level off eventually, I don't know. I'm sure a lot of that money goes to marketing. If you've ever seen a commercial that seems to be just for food in general, it's probably DoorDash. But another big chunk of their profits went towards something highly controversial, which was convincing Californians to support a legislature that lets them avoid avoid treating their drivers like employees. I have seen drivers on both sides of this argument. A lot of them say they should deserve benefits like employer health insurance and paid sick leave, while some of them don't mind being treated like a gig worker because it comes with so much flexibility. Regardless, when a bunch of companies spend $300 million on propaganda so they don't have to treat their drivers better, it's kind of a red flag. And between that and the opportunistic price gouging, it makes it really tough to feel good about supporting these apps. Especially when, like we talked about, you have to pay more money, the restaurants have to pay more money, and these delivery apps might all go bankrupt anyway. I guess I shouldn't be totally surprised. There's this whole side of Silicon Valley that I will never understand, where you have a company that's valued at $12 billion, but they're constantly just losing money. Like Netflix, for example. They spend billions more dollars every year than they make. I may be dumb, but don't you have to like stop doing that at some point? Eventually you're gonna run out. And if food delivery apps and an at-home streaming service can't be profitable during a time where there are circumstances that necessitate the use of both of those things, when will they ever be? So I just wonder what the future of this industry looks like. If there's a bubble that will eventually pop, if all of the people funding these companies eventually stop doing that and they cease to exist, that wouldn't be good for anyone. Not for the consumers who rely on it, not for the drivers who would now be unemployed. But the trajectory I see here is that only one of these companies will reign supreme and then they'll use their newfound monopoly to hike up all their prices until it gets to the point where no one wants to use them anymore because it costs $50 to deliver a taco. Sorry, I know this was a really unorganized video, I just had to get this rant off my chest. While we're on the topic of delivery services though, I wanna ask you guys a question. So I've noticed that even though I always used Lyft, I would still tell people like, oh, I'll Uber there, right? Uber was always the verb in that sentence. So I'm curious for you guys, when you get delivery to your house, which company is the verb that you use? Do you say, oh, I'm gonna Postmates Chili's or like I grub hubbed Red Lobster? Probably not that one, but I figured I'd still ask. So comment your answer down below if you want. I'll also probably do a Twitter poll about this because this is the kind of meaningless shit that gets me out of bed in the morning. Anyway, I gotta go DoorDash Dick's Sporting Goods. So in the meantime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Squarespace. Hi, I have website. You need website? Then listen up. Squarespace is the easiest way to make a beautiful homepage for your business or just something you like to do for fun. You can use it to advertise your work. You can use it to sell products you've made. You can use it to show off a JPEG of processed meat that features a revolving door of virtual condiments. I would prefer if you came up with your own idea, but at the end of the day, I'm not in charge of you. Follow your dreams. If you're looking to try and profit off your work, Squarespace has all the tools you need to make an aesthetically pleasing and fully functional online store. I used to run my own merch shop through a website I made with Squarespace and everything ran super smoothly. I was able to make it look exactly the way I envisioned it. I was able to set all the prices and quantity limits so I wouldn't oversell. I could see analytics about who was buying what and where they were coming from. And if you're worried about the website making process being overly complicated, don't be. That was my concern too, because I don't have any experience with coding or HTML, but it was super easy. You pretty much just pick a template and then customize it as little or as much as you want. So to take your business to the next level and get started with a free trial, head to squarespace.com and when you're ready to launch your website, use 
use promo code DREW, that's me, that's my name, for 10% off your first purchase. Also, if you do make a website, send it to me on Twitter. I love seeing what you guys make. And if you'd like to buy this shirt and give your family nightmares this holiday season, you can do so at pictureofhotdog.com. Anyway, thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Now back to my stunt double who has not been doing very many stunts lately. If you want me to do a stunt, then write one into the video. Sorry guys. Ooh, sounds like my dicks just got here. So I'm gonna go play with that. Thank you all so much for watching today's video. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday weekend. Maybe you didn't get to spend it with your family this year, but sometimes that's okay. It's officially Christmas season now, which means I will be back soon with a fun idea that I came up with for a video. In the meantime, if you're watching this video the day it came out, I currently have a Cyber Monday sale going up on my merch store. Lots of deals on there that you can choose to either take advantage of or fully ignore. But that's it, see you next time, and Merry Christmas. Have